Waste is an inevitable part of our lives and an ever-growing problem. The World Bank warns of a dramatic increase by 2050. And so finding new ways to manage our trash and water waste has become all the more urgent. On this episode of Leaders with L'Aqua Goes Green, I speak to the chief executive of the world's largest environmental services company, Veolia. Estelle Braklinoff says waste management has become fashionable as the effects of climate change become more extreme and governments and companies ramp up efforts to curb pollution. Estelle, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with L'Aqua. Thank you. So if somebody met you in the street and they say, what do you do for a living? You're in charge of Veolia. How would you describe your job? Ah, good question. I would say um, I'm here to uh, transform industries and cities so that they produce less carbon, consume less water, and consume less materials. So to help the planet be greener, in other terms. I mean, That's what I do for a living. It's, it's, a, it's a big job, and you work with water, energy, and waste. How have the three, or how different are they to manage? So another way of saying it is my market. What is it? It's ecological transformation. And in other words, it's uh, decarbonization, of course but decontamination or deep pollution, if you want as well. So removing pollutants so I can protect your health, mine and everybody else's. Same with recycling and circular economy. That's the market to operate. It's a huge one, uh, 2.5 trillion uh, euros every year, and it's fast growing and faster every day. So in a way, you, you can see, uh, you see it both ways. You know, the more the planet warms, and it is, the more you have water scarcity. Uh, but the good, the good part of it is we have solutions. And my job is to implement, duplicate, scale up the solution mm -hmm. and to be quicker because uh, the planet won't wait. And, and we won't wait, I mean the human on this planet as well. And, and these are solutions that you find. There's a lot of focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit in, in that supply chain of delivering innovation to, to be greener in the future? I guess, you know, we consider that to solve the big problem, I've said, uh, we already have half of the solution, and my priority is to scale them up, uh, to deploy them in the many, as many places as I can. The other half, you have to invent them, and that's where uh, innovation takes place. Uh, we are uh, having a lot of patents every single day, and we can do stuff now which five years ago was considered crazy. Uh, recycle things like electric car batteries, which five years we thought, wow, you know, we'll never be able to do that. We are able to recycle water almost infinitely. We are able to remove pollutant in water. Uh, things which, you know, like uh, five years or 10 years ago, we didn't know how to do. And I will have the same conversation in five years and you will discover that we found ways for other stuff as well. It's bigger, better. Um, yes, it is. Uh, but I guess uh, let's not forget another component. Uh, which is it has to be affordable as well. So I guess efficiency is a way to make all those solutions good, uh, not only for the planet, but for everybody's you know, um, capacity of uh, purchasing power, sorry, uh, as well as to protect your health. Uh, so I guess I'm not uh, here to save anything, but in a way to protect health, to protect quality of living, to protect purchasing power, have you seen a, sh a shift in appetite in actually talking about the green agenda or green issues w with investors but also with cities? Um, what's interesting is each time uh, we can see a kind of a, a, a shock of discovering solutions which are scalable and uh, here and now. And when the general public discovers that, usually we have a takeoff mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, demand. That was a case of recycling, you're right. Plastic recycling has been booming. Mm -hmm. That's the case of uh, all the solution we have to tackle water scarcity and water quality now. And that's not by chance. It came after summers of droughts in countries where we thought we will never be lacking water. And suddenly you realize ah, it may happen. Uh, so I guess you have moments of taking off and acceleration. Uh, that's more the way I, I would see that. Uh, so it's as much the, uh, and on energy, as in the ability to produce energy locally, as opposed to import fossil fuel. Uh, uh, so pr I'm talking about bioenergy you can produce from wastewater, from wasted heat, from waste or non-recyclable waste. 
that has taken off with the war in Ukraine uh, because people thought, you know what, instead of importing fossil fuel, what about we tap into the reservoir we have under our feet in every single of our uh, communities. But it, it feels like it's a crisis that's being dealt with one at a time. So recycling was a big thing three, four years ago. And I don't know whether you're taking a, you're seeing a back step in recycling less or being less decisive with recycling, or it's just that this keeps on going ahead, we just talk about it less. Uh, I guess uh, it's more the latter, uh, as in there is no way backwards. Uh, and uh, there is no big backwards in recycling, there is no big backwards in treating pollutants in your water, uh, there is no way backwards in, uh, in, um, in producing local energy. But you're right, the trends at times of what you talk in, in the press yeah. may, be, uh, may be different from one crisis to the next. Uh, my job is to go beyond crisis, to anticipate, yeah. that's why innovation, we knew we could do uh, recycling of plastics. For years, nobody was really interested in that. And suddenly, it takes off. But we found a solution in the meantime. Uh, so in a way, my job as a chief exec is to deal with the short term mm -hmm. and to be able to deliver essential services, even in time of crisis, as well as mm -hmm. to see the long term. So as you take out the nasty stuff, as you say, out of some of these water products, do you see actually more of them being added? I know there's a, a number of studies on microplastics in wherever we find them, especially in the brain, in the water. Do you see the amount of some of the things that is harmful being used more, and so does it make it your job more difficult to then purify that? Uh, I guess uh, the way I would see it is like uh, science progresses, uh, makes mm -hmm. progress, so we discover more things. Doesn't mean that they are new, but we maybe didn't have the, uh, the knowledge yeah. about them. Uh, again, the good news is to anticipate, so we are able yeah. to treat them as we uh, discover their existence mm -hmm. and the problem associated with it we are able to treat PFAS within Veolia end-to-end solution, whatever type of PFAS we have. So, so what's your biggest challenge, for example, in that to become more scalable? Is it getting the money from governments or from cities, or is it actually building them fast enough? So how could I speed up uh, in a way? Uh, it's, it's a question I constantly ask myself. <laughs> <laughs> and scale your team, up, I'm sure. <laughs> scale up and speed up. And uh, yeah, it's fair to say that I'm quite demanding to my team in terms of, uh, can we go okay. faster? Because again, our uh, fellow citizens are craving for, in a way, us bringing the solution. Um, more Veolia faster is good news for all of us in a way. Uh, so, um, I guess, what do we need to be efficient? We need uh, money, we usually can find it, mm -hmm. and we have money uh, available potentially in many, many places. Uh, we need a clear, let's say, legal framework. Mm -hmm. So stability of the legislation is key there. Um, we need, uh, as well, uh, the citizens to be on board and to understand, to general public mm -hmm. to understand, but we've conveyed a survey uh, across uh, 25 countries and 25,000 people across the globe in yep. many, many countries, and this is clear. Now, the general public does understand that uh, the cost of inaction will be higher than the cost mm -hmm. of action. So they are asking, uh, for those type of solutions. And then you need people like us to invent the solution and to have the scale to be able to deploy them and to invest in innovation as well. And, and our, our politicians on board, it seems like politics gets in the way of green technologies, but not always in, for example, health stories. Um, I guess uh, uh, in an ideal world, uh, to be able to go quicker, what uh, do you need from politician? Stability, constituent framework. This is absolutely key. Uh, Which we don't always we, have. We, we, would, uh, we are the one, uh, you know, like trying to find the best technology possible mm -hmm. to be able to deliver in the most efficient and affordable, and insist mm -hmm. on that one, way possible. But we need a framework, so we need everybody on board, politician, general public, company like us, and the financial system as well. All that align, uh, everybody has a, all the one I mentioned, has a role to play in this. Coming up, Estelle Brakhanov on artificial intelligence as both a tool and an obstacle to a more sustainable future.
Innovation is central to waste management. Without technology, the world would simply be overwhelmed by trash. Artificial intelligence is part of the solution, but it's also part of the problem as data centers put energy and water supplies at risk. I continue the conversation with the Veolia chief executive. To achieve a lot of your targets, and we talk about innovation, but you have to, I guess, identify the problem. Does AI help? Uh, AI can be part of the solution and is a problem at the same time. Yeah. So if I start with a problem, AI, data centers, they consume a lot of energy uh, and they need a lot of water. So actually we're providing services to the companies mm -hmm. which are uh, doing AI and it's a growing market. On the other side, uh, AI can benefit ecological transformation and saving water, saving energy, saving CO2 and so on and so forth. Uh, and can make a company like Veolia more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, uh, we are doing already quite a lot on AI. What we're testing uh, are ways to be optimizing downtime in our plant, for mm -hmm. instance, by being more efficient in tracking where the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, it can help you save enormous time. Of course, with everything with uh, call centers, you know, will be very helpful. Uh, we already have, you know, a lot of digital tools and it's already helping the company. But the next generation, uh, we're having a look. When I say we're having a look, we know it would work. Uh, the question we ask ourselves is, does it worth it? Right. So we know it would work. So we are trying to quantify the benefit in euros mm -hmm. mm -hmm. against the cost in euros and the cost yeah. in actually a negative impact uh -huh. on water and everything. Uh, okay. And we are, I tweet one or the, the, the other and we we'll probably will have a few where it's super interesting. But does the cost automatically come down in years to come or not necessarily? Um, I guess uh, the type of solution I, I'm talking about, uh, will co the cost of the solution will come down if we deploy right. ourselves okay. more and more. Yeah. So the scale will be important. Okay. So if I have a tool which works for only two plants, yeah. uh, there is a big yeah. bet that you know it won't worth it. If I can deploy it mm -hmm. into 2,000 units across the globe, then there may be a business case for it. Uh, it's a case for energy efficiency. We do already a lot, but yeah. we can do more. Uh, do you realize that in 80% of the case, when you install sensor on a building and you monitor live and you optimize it and AI can help, you can save 15 to 20% of energy without changing anything massive. But it's an upfront cost. It's usually an upfront cost, so there has to have a business mm -hmm. return for it, of course. Are, are we underestimating how much energy AI needs? That's, this is a negative. Uh, actually, in the US, it's very much at the forefront of a lot of people's agenda. Water is not yet, but it's uh, yeah. starting to go up because AI needs a lot of energy as well as water, typically to cool down yeah. the data centers. Yeah. But the good news is we can recycle water uh, yeah. and we can use the wasted heat yeah. and we're providing those type of services as well. So there is a solution pretty much to a lot of things, as long as you go on and never give up. Are, are you excited then about AI? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, excited as long as you pick the right opportunities and don't go for full AI on everything when you don't need it. Neither uh, an AI, I would say, denial as in, yes, it can bring solutions. So uh, as long as you pick the right battles, I think yeah. it can bring a lot of value, mm -hmm. including to save uh, water, waste and energy. So as we all try and, and become greener, mm -hmm. uh, maybe waste less, to, is there anything in your, in your personal life that you do differently now to five years ago? Oh, uh, interesting questions. Um, uh, probably, uh, probably the usual one is uh, flying only when I need. Uh, and I'm going more for, like everybody else, I guess, for uh, visio when you can. Uh, at times, nothing replaces the real contact or the real visit or everything. Uh, but at times, you can very well do with, you know, uh, visio and everything. So that's an obvious one. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, if you think about water, uh, uh, you have a lot of things at home which you are very much more careful uh, when you know that, for instance, if you have your tap open, 12 liters per minute. 
that's enormous. If you realize that, you will think differently about your daily life as well. So turn the tap off when you brush your teeth. Exactly. Coming up, Estelle Brachtenhoff on why she believes she has the dream job. Estelle Brachtenhoff has been at Veolia for almost two decades and in the top job for two years. She's witnessed and helped guide the company's global growth. I asked her about her own journey and why she's optimistic about Veolia's future path. You love your job. I do. <laughs> what do you love most about it? Ah, um, I love the, the Veolia. Uh, as, um, it's a great company for lots of reasons. Uh, the work we do, the job we do, the business we're in, which is wonderful. We are part of the solution, you know, so I cannot dream of a better company to work for. Everybody's engaged to try and help and deliver oh. the solution. I love this uh, vibration of excitement. Uh, I love the variety of it. Uh, you know, you would be from one day with a great level politician national wide, with a blue collar worker, with a technician, whatever, and it's very varied. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fair to say uh, I try to set ambitious goals, but which are realistic at the same time. Uh, so at times you, you feel like you have the, the head in the sky and the stars, but uh, very much grounded at the same time. So try to say, okay, you have to manage, uh, to manage both. And this is very important to you, that actually you, whatever you say you want to stick to, is that, is that because of your personality or is it something that is just required in business? Oh, I won't, uh, I, I won't uh, give lesson to anyone. This is the way I am, probably, <laughs> more than anything. Um, um, I'm more, uh, you know, like, uh, let's, uh, let's do something together and, you know, together with a team and I would uh, roll up my sleeve myself and go with them and fight the battles we have to fight, but together, uh, if I feel like in, we can uh, win it, uh, rather than say, okay, you should, and then I go into another road. So it's more probably my style of management as well. I mean, it's interesting because you have an industry that's not considered very sexy and actually it's so crucial to our changing our economies used to be not very sexy, but I can see we have a lot of incoming calls mm. from people wanting to join the company because they feel like, okay, you're in the bad part of, the good part again of, uh, of uh, trying to deliver solution. But so, so when you look at 2024, 2025 and beyond, do leaders and CEOs have to have a conscience? Uh, they do have a conscience, so who am I <laughs> <laughs> to say they should? Um, I guess the way I would think of it myself will be more, I'm the same human being at home than I am when I'm a chief exec of Veolia. This is the same person. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, I have a split Estelle. Uh, mm -hmm. That's more the way I would see it. Uh, and I'm proud of what we do. It's tough. No. I'm a fighter. I think I mm -hmm. never give up. Uh, but, uh, but in the end, we are all super proud about what we do. But where did you learn that, to, to fight or never give up? Um, probably I always had it in me, I guess. <laughs> um, but I guess I'm uh, very much, uh, when there is a will, there is a way type of lady. Uh, uh, and uh, love uh, to, be with a, to be with a team as well. Uh, so I guess love this uh, uh, team atmosphere of, you know, everybody has a a view and you have a diverse mm -hmm. views on things and learn from that mm -hmm. and then you go even beyond what you would even have mm -hmm. imagined before. I was appointed two years ago, you know what, uh, it's even better than what I thought. What did you think it'd be like? <laughs> you never exactly <laughs> know how it's going to be like, but I guess it's even better, you know, we've achieved stuff mm -hmm. I never even could have dreamt you with we would have achieved. So we've been able to deal with, when you think about the number of crises mm -hmm. we've been able to deal with um, in the last two years, and why it's constantly delivering results which are growing mm -hmm. quarter after quarter. Mm -hmm. But we all have bad days in the office. Yes. What, what does an Estelle bad day look like? Ah, uh, uh, failure, of course, you know, have a lot, so that wouldn't be necessarily a bad day. It's more, what do you do with it? Okay, mm -hmm. I've missed this one. What can I go next differently so that it works better? 
uh, what um, uh, frustration that you know things don't move maybe as fast as uh, as I, th I think it should uh, would be probably a, okay you know like, no. Uh, let's rest a little bit uh, and go on, you know. Uh, that would be probably one. Um, and uh, maybe when I don't have the right mixture of uh, the blue sky and the ground, when I have too much of the theory or too mm -hmm. much of the very much too much daily, uh, maybe uh, I need a little bit of both. What do you think you've changed? Every time you speak to a chief executive, they say, look, in your first three, six months in the job, that's when you can make changes. So shorter meetings, longer meetings, more travel, less travel, work-life balance, whatever it is. W what was your North Star? So uh, what's, um, what's interesting for me, it's, it's been uh, chief exec for two years, so I've had my three months and six months, mm -hmm. but I've been in the company for almost 20 years. Uh, so there was already a lot of things that I've done being number two of the company before and so on and so forth. So it's more uh, even going even further than uh, totally uh, on and off uh, like for other type of situations. Um, I guess, uh, I guess the, uh, the target I still have uh, will be to try and free time on my agenda mm. to be able to I guess uh, let the dust settle a bit and uh, think a little bit ahead mm -hmm. or interact with people without having to be efficient as in mm -hmm. directly deliver on that day on the specific mm -hmm. item. That's something I haven't achieved mm -hmm. properly fully yet. Yeah. Uh, that's something. Uh, but I've changed a lot of things. I've, uh, the company is more international than it used to be mm -hmm. uh, in its figures but in its mindsets and probably more inclusive of people coming from different backgrounds. I mean, uh, another question we like asking mm -hmm. our chief executives is would you ever actually hire a climate denier in 2024? Um, I, I'm not so sure there are that many, if I may. Uh, you, you can see around people saying, oh, okay, I know there is a problem, but it's too late, there is nothing to do, so let's not do anything. I think we've moved from the climate denier to the uh, mm -hmm. doom and gloom, there is nothing we can do about it, so let's not do anything, uh, in my opinion, yeah. on the vast majority. Um, I guess, uh, I guess uh, trying to interact with people and convince them is always interesting. So <laughs> You like a challenge? <laughs> yes, I do like challenges. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, dare would be the one. And uh, uh, trust your gut feel would be another one. Uh, go from the brain and thinking to the, mm. okay, I feel like we could go this route. Probably those two. And w what do you do in the next five years? If I speak to you in five years, where will you be? Uh, hopefully, I will have the same enthusiasm, energy, and uh, excitement about you know running this wonderful company, which will be even bigger and more successful uh, in five years than it is already now, um, and, uh, and uh, have the impression that uh, I've had an impact with my team. Impact on you know, uh, CO2, on water, mm -hmm. and maybe impact on uh, the vision, on uh, what used to be a non-sexy company, as you said, or non-sexy industry, you say, okay, I want to be in. Maybe that will be it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Francine.